Um, welcome to this webinar today on uh, DSARs, or Digital Subject Access Requests, Data Subject Access Requests, as some people call them. Uh, my name is Mark. <clears throat> I'm going to be your um, intro and your Q&A person at the start and end of this session. A um, little bit about me. I spent 30 years in law enforcement. Um, really over 20 of that was in and around all things digital, from forensics and cyber investigations, from decent images, fraud, counterterrorism, and also national security. Joining me today on this are uh, Nicholas Pollard and Ollie Lyon. Nick has been with NewX for almost eight years and now leads our strategic alliances. And Ollie has been with us for a number of years and has over seven years experience in the e-discovery world in both legal and corporate. And I'm gonna pass over to them very shortly. But just before I do so, in preparation for this, I just Googled um, DSAR this morning to see what was new. Um, and probably gathered from my accent, from my part of the world, one of the things that came up was um, my old police force, um, a major data breach within the PSNI has been described as a wake up call for forces across the UK. This happened a couple of months ago, uh, in fact, August last year, when there was nine and a half thousand uh, of their staff, their personal details were released by mistake. And a report which was later published said the leak was a wake up call for every force across the UK to take the security of data as seriously as possible. Uh, and that just really puts the context about how serious we need to be thinking about our um, security of information and security of data. So I'm going to stop talking and uh, we're tight for time. Um, Nicholas, over to you. Thank you. And thank you very much, Mark, for the intro and good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome. So let me just move on. As, as Mark said, I am celebrating eight years at NUIX. Um, I've actually been in the industry since 2006, uh, joining into the sort of legal side of it. I've worked through e-discovery and cybersecurity and, and forensics for some years and sort of been part of all sorts of notable sort of um, uh, global events uh, over my time working in this industry. Uh, looking forward to taking you through this DSAR workflow. And as Mark has rightly alluded to, uh, any type of event that could happen uh, from a disastrous event such as FOIA within PSNI through to the things we're gonna to touch on today in the finance industry, just basically demonstrates how fast the data subject access world suddenly becomes, and it has become highly weaponized, which is what we're gonna to touch on today. So uh, let me introduce you to Ollie. Thanks, Nick. Yep, so I'm Oliver Line. I've got uh, seven years experience working in e-discovery for legal and corporate, as Mark mentioned. Uh, I've been with Nuix now for two and a bit years, um, and my background is just management of various global e-discovery projects. Um, so that's kind of end-to-end uh, -end solution focused on review and analysis and uh, producing any kind of, of uh, any of those documents out to a regulator in a, in a court bundle or a or regulatory package. So uh, that's a bit of my background. Back to you, uh, Nick. Magic. So uh, thank you, Oliver. And uh, right, let us take us through Nuix. So for those of you that don't know Nuix or, or, or may have heard of us but don't know what we do, uh, we, we're kind of, we've been around for years. We, we actually uh, entered into the industry of forensics and, and cybersecurity e-discovery back in 2006. And as the strap line there shows, um, we use our technology as a force for good. And the images on the right hand side of the screen demonstrate some of the sort of the global events that actually are shocking as they happen. And of course, once they happen, inquiries start to um, uh, take place and um, the governments get involved and start to pose those significant and serious questions in the, pub in the public interest with regards to what's happened. And if I focus on the bottom right hand corner there, uh, where you've got the bridge collapse, now that bridge collapse happened in Italy in Genoa uh, back in, well, I believe 2017. And a tremendous loss of life, 40 plus people sadly lost their lives that day. And it, it just highlights then what then happens afterwards. And there's a five year inquiry that has taken place um, with that. All of these that you see on the screen are underpinned by a new infrastructure. So all this data that is um, requested as a result of these tragic events, typically then arrive into a new platform for the purposes of investigation. 
From that, we have a number of techniques that we then take into the world of legal, into cybersecurity and so on. So I'm going to take you through that um, as we go. Just a little bit about NUIX in numbers. Uh, as, um, as alluded to, we, we came to the market in 2006. Uh, we are headquartered out of Sydney, Australia, um, and we have thousands of customers. We're very proud of our customer base, which range from government to the regulators, to law enforcement, corporates, and, and so on. And we have offices um, all over um, the, the globe supporting those that sort of various different regions that we, we look after. So what does NUIX do? Well, our paralleled, uh, paralleled engine, so this engine that can process vast volumes of data is applied to all sorts of use cases. And we're gonna to touch on sort of three that are somewhat touched on here. So for example, you've got achieve compliance, well, that's a GDPR thing, perhaps, or I need to sort of uh, win a complex legal case, well, I've got a legal request here for data, and I am, of course, uh, protecting personal data. But NUIX is used for so much more than that. We're gonna focus in on the very specific um, uh, workflow of DSAR, but as you can see, we, we are used for a number of different sort of enterprise and commercial challenges that unstructured data and data in general presents us. And I'll take you through that in a, in, in a bit. So first of all, let's talk about the weaponized DSAR. Um, and we've, we've got used to DSAR. DSARs have been in, in our world now since uh, 2018. Uh, we are in year six of GDPR, uh, which is quite an interesting uh, dateline, actually, because year seven, i.e. next year, we start to hit the interesting time zone of data that becomes irrelevant to a business because you've hit in the seven-year marker of retention policies. So we're in that year now of, of starting to look at what do we do for next year in regard to data that contains PII, uh, the regulations about how do we maintain them and should we maintain them and how do we respond to requests when data is somewhat seven years and older. Anyway, DSARs have got sort of more and more and more into the public eye. And what has happened now is that they've essentially become weaponized. They are used for all sorts of um, purposes by um, the general public for multiple different things. It could be for a disgruntled employee using it against their employer. It could be that you've got an unhappy customer who's, who's sending a, a request out to a business. And in the instance we're gonna go through today, a financial situation that then leads to, I'm gonna request my information because guess what? I need to understand whether I'm part of some sort of um, uh, feedback money that's gonna to come to it. I'll touch on how that goes. but. DSARs have essentially become weaponized. So let's kind of take you through some news. And the first sort of headline I've got here is the FCA. So the Financial Conduct Authority announced back in January uh, of this year that they're sort of getting wind of this challenge with regards to um, uh, commission payments being made to um, the sellers of motor vehicles with regards to the loans and, and PCP um, uh, finance arrangements that would be arranged about cars. And what there was is there, there seems to be some disparity between what the bank was charging as an APR, what the car uh, seller was uh, basically claiming. There's a bit of distance there. And they say, congratulations, Mr. Pollard, you've bought a car and uh, we're gonna charge you 7.9% APR when they're buying it 2.9%. And so this, this sort of difference is this bit that's discretionary and they didn't make you aware that essentially this is an undisclosed commission payment of which we, the public, should have known about. So the FCA have rightly stated, this, does, this doesn't feel right, we need to start investigating. And of course, then things start to snowball. So of course, then um, people like the Financial Times then get, get hold of it and they're starting to look at well, who's directly sort of affected by this? Where, where does this lead to? So, of course, all the major banks that are backing these uh, financial um, offerings to, to the motor vehicle trade are now directly impacted. So you've got some major brands of financial institutions that, of course, lend money all day long. Suddenly, they're now in the real hot spotlight 
of um, the potential that, that the FCA is after them for, for this particular sort of uh, DCO issue. Then along comes the very popular journalist, Martin Lewis. And Martin Lewis grabs hold of it and he does a whole ITV special uh, earlier in the year, uh, now announcing to you know, the millions of people that watch the show to basically say, are you affected by car finance uh, and the, the potential wrongdoing of this, this uh, DCO issue? So what does he do? He creates a magic little tool that's on his website that creates um, DSAR requests. Um, and so, of course, you've now got potentially hundreds of thousands of people going on to uh, that website and generating a DSAR request. And this DSAR request is particularly interesting because the chap who's currently presenting alongside me, uh, Mr. Oliver Lyon, this is his. <laughs> so we've used one that, that, it, that has been created specifically for Ollie because he bought a car back in whatever it was, and he's part of this, this thing. So. What happens? That's now going to go out to um, the bank that, that has loaned him the money in order to ascertain whether he is potentially liable for some sort of payback. So let's now look at some other facts um, with regards to DSARS. So this is um, a summary of an EY report that was that came out last year. Um, and so these numbers, 60%, um, 60 of the um, respondents to the survey said that they've seen a marked increase in DSAR requests. So that, that sort of follows the industry trends. I'd be, I'm fascinated to see what next year's numbers will be because there's going to be a significant upshift, uh, especially within the financial services sector, um, who are responding now to the potentially thousands of requests coming their way as a result of this um, specific issue. 20. 20 grand, that is the average cost for a DSAR request for a small to medium sized business, 20,000 pounds. For the large businesses, of course, they will have some level of um, capability to do these in-house. Um, we're gonna to touch on sort of how Newix approaches this particular subject. But in general, if you're a smaller business, it's highly likely that you will pull in um, third parties to help you navigate the challenges that the GDPR DSAR request will bring. And then the 33, 33% of the um, data that's now being requested is coming from claims management companies. So these are these no win, no fee businesses that pipe up and say, oh, if you've been affected by this, um, this awful commission thing, we can win your battle for you. Um, and they'll take a cut. I think the challenge with that is, of course, that they are going to bombard the financial industries um, with multiple, multiple claims because that's in their interest. Uh, what the uh, people that use these firms uh, don't realize, of course, is that the DSAR request that they are requesting could reveal all manner of financial information and very personal information, which perhaps they've not realized is going to now be shared with a third party. But anyway, let's move on. So we're going to go into sort of the anatomy of um, workflow of a DSAR request. And Oliver's going to take you through this in a, in a more specific fashion. But I thought it'd just be cool to sort of graphically demonstrate how these things happen. And I'm sure for, for those of you watching, we'll have some familiarity to how this happens. But it's always good to go through it. So the requester comes in and he says, I would like my information, please. And so, of course, that search request is going to be received by the data privacy officer or the that DPO team. And likely they're going to send some search criteria down to the IT teams that are specifically relevant to this requesting information. Now, of course, that information can be quite ambiguous. Um, it can have um, difficult date ranges uh, because the requester doesn't realize that perhaps they need to be quite specific. And there are all sorts of rules that the ICO state about um, being very specific about what date ranges you want. But nonetheless, the IT people are now confronted with the challenge of finding data that is now responsive to that search request. I deal with a client um, at the moment who has over 300 separate systems. So you can imagine that the, the question that's now going to be asked is, 
where on earth is this data? Do we think it's in one location? Is it spread across multiple locations? How far and wide and deep does the requester's data go? Uh, are we to respond to all? And so there's all these sorts of questions about where the sources of information are uh, before they then, of course, have to then pass on to um, some sort of review. Now, that's likely to either go to the DPO team, it might go to general counsel, it might even go to third party advisories or, or law firms in particular, because you don't have the in-house capability to review this information. One of the most challenging aspects um, of the, the review part of this and something that Oliver will take you through is then the redaction techniques that take place. Um, quite often data could be overwhelmed um, with other personal information that is not the requesters. So the challenge then comes is how on earth do I redact all their data out of all this unstructured information I've now got in an efficient manner that can be then served back to the requester within the 30 day limit. So these are the common sort of challenges uh, that, that, that come. So one of the interesting uh, points of and point task two there, understand data risk. What was quite interesting about the recent uh, Coots event with Nigel Farage was quite clearly they didn't understand the data risk. Um, they, they collected all the data freely and easily, but under review, they really should have caught that this potentially could be a significantly damaging amount of data we're about to provide to Mr. Farage. They were obliged to give it to them, but at least be somewhat aware the, the, um, what that data is going to reveal. And of course, they didn't, and, or if they did, they did a really bad job of knowing it. Um, so what does the data say? How incriminating is it? What reputational damage will occur if I give this data over? I have to, because by law I have to, but there are other means of going, well, perhaps we need to be a little bit more careful. Point is, they didn't review it. And so what reputational damage well, my goodness me, if we think of the NatWest Coots thing, it went all the way up to, to government. Government threatened them with the removal of their of their um, uh, trading license for being a bank. And the uh, I think the CEO resigned. So pretty, pretty bad stuff that happened to them there. So the key is repeatable, defendable processes, utilizing automation and AI wherever possible. Absolutely. So what we're going to do now is sort of get into the bit of the nuts and bolts of how do we do this? How does um, an organization cope with a huge influx of data through whatever purpose? How do they do that in a repeatable way that is defendable and has an efficient method of getting data back to the requester so that um, everyone's happy? We're going to take you through that in a moment. So first of all, let's just take you through the newest data privacy approach. Um, and so this is utilizing a NEO platform. And essentially you have four core parts of, of the solution. Part one, identify data map. Where is my data? Where do you think PII data is likely to um, uh, reside? How easy and accessible is it? In what format is it? Is it structured information? Is it unstructured information? Is it semi-structured? Is it in Office? Is, is it in Lotus Notes, God forbid? You know, where, where on earth is this data? I've then got about to understand it. Can I extract information at speed and scale to identify personal identifiable information in a quick and timely fashion to make sure that my review and analysis of that data is fast, focused, and can deliver? And then finally, I'm going to take action on it. I'm going to deliver that data back to the requester um, in a timely fashion. So if I take that into sort of a different context, so unstructured, semi-structured and structured data, where are my repositories? And it could be that those repositories could be in Office 365, they could be in a Google uh, Drive, they could be on your endpoints, they could be in various different silos and servers and infrastructure and quite often can be overlooked. So for example, data that sits in your expenses system, you may not realize, of course, that is perfectly liable for PII research. That expenses system might not even be using uh, software you're aware of, it's using a third party software, that data should be revealed. As much as endpoint data that is stored locally on a laptop or whatever, you need to know where that is, what type of format it in, 
is it in a format that I can freely read, understand, and extract information from? So once I've got my list of data, I'm then gonna feed it into the solution to go through those four core pillars. And at that point, I've then got a number of different options using the NEO solution to enable um, the fast and effective search to enable you to solve this, solve the problem you've currently got of how on earth do I get through this data? Now, in this particular instance, we're going to uh, look at the Discover solution in, in particular focus, which um, Oliver is going to take you through shortly. Let me just finish up. So, some of the other challenges that, that come within an enterprise environment is the sheer scale of the, of the problem of where my data resides. Anuix is very proud to have a solution called Rampiva, which enables us to orchestrate and automate the, the vast array of different collection points that could come from multiple different systems in an effective manner. So as you can see here, you've got a number of different options on the right-hand side that enable uh, Nuix to essentially automate this, this process in a repeatable fashion. I've got a DSAR request. That DSAR request is for Oliver Line, and so um, it's gonna go through, it's gonna go, ah, okay, we've got a Microsoft 365 account on that. We might link into Purview or something like that. We might need to link into an endpoint. I'm going to automate these in a method that enables my reviewers a fast and effective method of seeing that data as quickly as possible. So there are an, any number of different options available in an automation of an enterprise capable search. Just some interesting side points. Uh, we have a, a particular customer at the moment who is looking at this with the likes of um, uh, uh, people that go traveling to search information that's on laptops for the purposes of risks of export certifications. And so they're using ServiceNow. And so they click on ServiceNow, that launches a Nuix ticket using the automation technology. Nuix searches the endpoint, goes, you're all good, or no, there's documents here that you need to review. And this is all managed within the ServiceNow environment with Nuix bolted into that. So you kind of see how an enterprise-wide orchestration technique can become very much a reality uh, using tools that the customers are already using, like ServiceNow as an example, to aid this sort of automation capability. So I'm just going to take you through the rest of those, and I am going to pass over to Mr. Oliver Lyon. Thank you, Nick. Um, and I will remember, remember you when I'm rolling in those millions from that uh, finance agreement. Um, so yeah, thanks uh, everyone for joining. I just wanted to kind of take you through the uh, the end-to-end DSAR -end workflow um, as kind of recommended by Nuix. Uh, we do have internal guides on this, so this is a this is something that we follow quite closely. Um, and as Nick's alluded to, we've seen quite an increase in these kinds of requests coming in, and a lot of appetite for people to find a solution uh, for them to be able to resolve this issue themselves. Um, it's obviously increasing um, exponentially in terms of the amount of data that everybody leaves behind everywhere they go. Um, weaponizing DSARs, as Nick mentioned, um, talking about um, you know uh, disgruntled employees, for example, um, they can you know it can be quite frequent that you end up having to sift through quite a lot of data and find out where that data exists pull it from all of those different sources um, and then kind of make sense of it and and uh, and apply that review process. And I think one of the more kind of popular approaches when you're working on smaller DSARs is, um, is to kind of find that data manually through kind of Outlook searching, um, maybe using Adobe to kind of perform those redactions and then, and then providing that data. Um, there's so many efficiencies that you can build into that workflow uh, to ensure that you're kind of automating that process where you can, applying AI capabilities where you can, uh, and ensuring that you're meeting that looming 30-day uh, deadline. Um, and also, you know, in a nutshell, reducing that uh, that cost of each DSAR that, uh, that ends up uh, creeping up at the end as well. Uh, cool. So I'll just move through the slides, and then we'll go through a, a kind of basic workflow um, from the point of receiving a DSAR request. Uh, so you receive your DSAR request, and then we move on to a stage of kind of templatizing and, and uploading that data. Uh, so we can uh, create a Nuix Neo DSAR workflow template, 
uh, templates are useful because uh, you know you're going to be receiving a lot of different DSARs for different requesters. So you may want to keep that data separate and have your different templates set up for different purposes. Uh, you can also kind of clone those templates across and and just keep reusing the work product that you've already created from those templates. Um, so from there, you can identify and collect data sources. So with Nuix, there's a, a numerous number of ways that you can go out and and uh, and pull data via um, connectors. Um, so if you have any data sitting on SharePoint or Exchange or Office 365, you can pull that information um, and process that directly. Uh, and then here is where you would create your project um, from your template. Um, and then you uh, would apply any intelligent filtering or, or uploads here. So this is where um, kind of AI will play some of the role. Um, date ranges will play a role. You know, keywords will play a role. Um, you're talking about maybe I don't want to upload everything. Maybe I just want to find um, specific documents within a certain date range for me to then um, upload and get onto the system for me to look at. Um, uh, as Nick alluded to, um, we've got our, our leading engine processing. Um, so with that comes the entity extraction. So we can extract out any kind of um, entities associated with account numbers, uh, phone numbers, email addresses, geolocation information, um, anything that we can enrich that data with for to make it easy for us to find the relevant information. Uh, we would do that at the at the upload stage there. So once you've got the data in, you're on to kind of searching and finding that information and highlighting those uh, those keywords within your, your file. Um, so you maybe perform an early case assessment at this stage, see how many files you've got, uh, provide any reporting that you needed to um, to anybody else that's on the project. Uh, one of those reports being the search term report. So if you were to run a list of keywords over that data, then you can pull a search term report out. Nine times out of 10 with a DSAR request, this is just going to be the requester's name, but it could include things like a phone number um, or account number or things along those lines as well. Um, and with those phone numbers and account numbers, you can actually make it a lot easier for yourself by extracting uh, personally identifiable information um, from, from the files and creating entities of them to be able to highlight those entities within the file. Um, so you can also use that to, uh, to highlight regular expressions within a file. So you can then, your eyes go straight to where a national insurance number is for somebody that you're not providing uh, that data for. And then you know that you need to redact that information. Um, so we found our data set and we've searched our, our, uh, our requester. Uh, here is where you would then go on to the kind of review process. Uh, so you'd maybe go through a first pass review, um, look at those personally ad identifiable information indicators and perform bulk redactions on them. So you can actually just feed uh, a keyword list into um, uh, the system and then run uh, redactions over you know, hundreds of documents if you wanted to in, in one go. Um, which obviously makes it increasing, increasingly effective. And I'll show you uh, how that looks in practice in a second. Um, and then you maybe perform document, document level redactions. So you might QC the bulk redactions that you've made um, or you know apply any kind of finer redactions that you need to to the file. Uh, and then maybe if you've got a large amount of documents, you might have a second pass or a QC review there as well. And then we're moving on to the preparation and the delivery to the requester. Um, so this is where you would prepare and compile the documents. You'd maybe provide any reporting that you needed to on those documents uh, and then securely deliver to uh, the data subject. So there's there's a lot of kind of steps there from, from end to end. Um, but what I'm going to show you through the key features elements that we're coming to uh, is how we can tackle those much more efficiently rather than kind of going down the approach of manual searching and manual redactions and all that kind of stuff that comes with the, with, um, with the DSL. Cool. So the, the first key feature that I wanted to discuss is just this names normalization. So when you process data into Discover itself, it will actually extract the uh, the aliases that are to do with a particular individual. Um, so if you have any email information and you've got those from two CC and BCC metadata fields, uh, the system will extract any uh, email alias for an individual and place them under one identity. Um, so we can see in the screenshot here, uh, and we're going to be focusing on this individual quite a lot in these screens, um, Sally Beck uh, has quite a lot of data in this Enron data set. Uh, and we can see quite a large number of email aliases um, down the bottom, one of them being 
uh, at alumni.utexas, for example. Um, maybe we hadn't considered that email address for that particular individual. Maybe we would have only considered the enron.com domain. Um, so it gives you the opportunity to be over-inclusive right off the bat and just make sure that you're scooping up everything you need to. Um, and you can even see at a glance there, um, you know, straight away when you've processed that data in, just how many emails are falling under those email aliases as well. Uh, so from that identity, you can then just run a simple search to um, find the identity as Sally Beck. Um, so obviously that's going to just going to search all of the email aliases to do with that particular individual. So we can do that all in one uh, in one hit rather than having to type in each of those email addresses separately. Um, but we also want to look for the the content for this particular individual. Um, so you can search for document content contains Sally Beck. So this this may bring back things like you know employee listings um, or instances where people are talking about Sally Beck, but maybe she's not a part of the communication. Um, and we've put a within three operator between those two words, Sally and Beck, uh, just to ensure that we're being over-inclusive in our search to say, I want to find Sally within three words of Beck. And that can also work um, back to front as well. So if you've got Beck, comma, Sally in a document anywhere, that will also um, come up in your search there as well. Cool. Move on. Um, so to reduce this uh, population even further, we can uh, apply email threading to it. Um, so we've we've run our search, we found our documents, and in this particular example, we've got uh, 9,416 documents that we're looking at here. Um, but what we can do is only review the documents that are actually relevant uh, and, and not duplicative in content. And what I mean by that is if we have an email thread going back and forth, uh, 15 emails in that thread. If you read that most recent 15th email, you would have read all of the content in the 14 preceding emails. What's the point in you then having those other 14 in your review population? Um, so once you've run that analysis, you can then just select all of the documents that are considered pivots in this thread data column in your list. Uh, and then that will ensure that um, uh, that you're only reading the most inclusive uh, email in the thread. Some exceptions to that will be whether people have added or removed attachments or added or removed participants. Um, that will, uh, you know, um, that will be included in your result set just to make sure that you're understanding the context of why somebody was removed from a thread, for example. Cool. Uh, so the next um, topic is review workflows. So this is actually particularly useful if you've got a team of reviewers. So you may have a particularly large DSAR um, review to, to go through. And if you've got um, you know, e even two reviewers, this can be beneficial. Um, what this does is it will break up the, um, the, the review set that you have into separate batches that reviewers can come in and manually check out themselves. Uh, so I've got one batch there assigned to myself. That is one that I went into the system and I said, yep, I want to get 502 documents. Uh, and I clicked on that get button and that gave me 502 documents, which means any other reviewer that comes into the system, um, they won't end up reviewing that 502 documents. So it prevents your reviewers from ending up uh, reviewing the same content, um, which obviously just you know wouldn't be required over the course of review. And with that um, comes the benefit of tracking a review as well. So you can actually use a review dashboard to be able to uh, understand and estimate when your review is actually going to be completed, just to make sure that you're uh, in line with um, with the 30-day turnaround time for these DSARs. Um, so moving on to the actual kind of looking at documents and how do I find that content and who's involved in, in the file and maybe moving on to redactions and how do I apply that. So we do have um, hit highlighting options within Discover. So uh, immediately I've ran my requester here and we can see that in yellow it's highlighted where that requester exists in my file. So if you're working with a particularly large file textually, um, you can go straight to where that particular individual resides in the file. Um, and then kind of determine the context around it and ensure that it is the, the correct data subject. Um, and then if we move forward, we've got our conditional coding pane as well. So that particular file, if we've looked at it and we've said, yep, our request is in there, we've got to make a decision on this. Uh, do we release it or do we withhold it? 
So over on the right hand side, we've got um, a kind of basic DSAR um, uh, coding pane that we've set up, and this actually feeds into the to the templatizing of the of the uh, cases. So if you were to create this as a template with these coding decisions, you could clone this and have all the coding decisions come over to um, to your new case that you're creating for a new requester. So you don't have to come in and keep uh, you know keep creating this work product. Uh, so to make a decision on a on a document, um, you can just click on the button, uh, and it will be uh, you know it will change to release or withhold. Um, but the reason it's conditional is that you can apply certain conditions to fields that you've selected. So for example, in this instance, if a reviewer tags a document withhold, um, they have to give a reason why. So they have to say it's an incorrect data subject or it's privilege. Um, for example, and these are all customizable to your um, very specific needs as well. Uh, once you've met that condition, you'll see that nice little green coding is complete pane down the bottom and a, a blue next button to move on to the next document. So just to make it as easy as possible for reviewers to come in, understand you know, what, it, what it's going to take for them to complete a review for a document and move on to the next one. Okay, so... Um, in terms of redaction capabilities, um, obviously I mentioned uh, Adobe at the uh, at the top of my uh, my segment there. Uh, you've got the ability here to just kind of manually draw in redactions if you want to. Um, it's it is old fashioned and inefficient. Um, so what you can do is actually just create keyword lists of other individuals that are a part of a file, um, and then you can uh, look and find those other individuals with a file. Uh, within the file and then just click on the individuals that you want to on the left hand side and hit apply uh, and that will actually automatically apply redactions to all of those individuals within the file apart from the request to sally beck herself so um extremely quick and easy to do uh, and you can do this obviously on a, on a document by document basis another thing you could use here is uh, regular expressions um so if you were to look for um, phone numbers, you can create a keyword list to find phone numbers, national insurance numbers, uh, account numbers. Um, so you'll see actually in this file itself, there is a, a phone number there that we maybe want to uh, want to redact as well. Uh, and it looks from the context around it to be shown as a uh, phone number. So you could set up a, um, a uh, you know a regular expression there to identify all those phone numbers and bulk redact those as well. Um, coming further down the line, we'll be implementing our nat natural language processing into um, Discover. Uh, it's something that our development team are working on to try and um, build out some form of kind of uh, a bulk redaction based off of the natural language processing as well. So there's some, some more exciting stuff coming uh, along the road that we're, we're looking towards. Um, cool. So um, as I mentioned, you can do that in bulk as well. So in the same way that you would with that find and redact, um, feed it a list of keywords. You can uh, feed a bulk redaction job a list of keywords, um, and then you can uh, apply redactions across multiple uh, documents. So for example, this one here, I've got 445 documents in total, um, and we found 39,000 um, terms uh, through our, our keyword list. And it's gone ahead and, and redacted those 39,891 terms. Now, obviously, you know, what you're talking about here is a significant amount of time saving um, with the um, with with the redactions there. Um, and to, talking about time saving as well, it's um, it's a theme that's running across this uh, and getting that document population down to a manageable amount. Uh, it's probably worth mentioning that more recently I've kind of um, worked on some demo data that uh, uh, that we did for a, a DSAR, and um, we had about uh, 69,000 documents. Uh, if you boil that 69,000 documents down and apply deduplication, um, keyword searches, um, we ended up getting that down to 5,000 with you know email threading and everything. So 69,000 to 5,000 is a 93% um, uh, decrease. Um, so if we consider the the amount that we could have ended up having to kind of review because we didn't really know where to start or, or what we were doing, so sixty four thousand, um, it would take you about forty four days or a thousand and sixty six hours of continual review. Um, I just wanted to mention those figures uh, because it's interesting to see how this technology really can actually just get you down to the stuff that you need to see 
and you need to put in front of reviewers and save you all that time, especially if it's you know 44 days exceeding the 30 days that you have to respond to this. Um, so I just want to kind of really hit home that this technology will help you do that. Cool. And then I think lastly, um, some more newer additions to the tool. Um, we do have uh, Excel reduction capability. So if you have a large Excel file, uh, you can then extract that um, Excel as a native out of the system and provide that natively. And then the content within the cells uh, themselves will be redacted. This is particularly useful because Excels are notoriously difficult to handle where, when you're redacting information because uh, in order to redact, you have to create an image version of that file. If you create an image version of a large Excel file, uh, what will end up happening is uh, you will end up um, with a lot of pages that you need to go through and redact and uh, it is extremely difficult to do. So we've introduced this Excel redaction feature and um, we've had great feedback from it so far, lots of people using it in anger. Um, so uh, that's also one to look out for and, and assist you with your um, uh, your details there as well. Um, and lastly, if, uh, if the need arose, we do have the capability to uh, redact audio uh, information as well. So we can create a transcript of an audio file uh, so if you have a lot of kind of trader phone calls or something along those lines, you can uh, put those into the system, analyze them, create a transcript. And then you can similarly to the find and redact feature, go through that transcript and uh, identify those um, individuals within your transcript and then apply the redaction. And what that does to the audio file is when you get that out of the system, it will actually replace that uh, section of the audio file with white noise. Uh, so you can actually, for the purposes of your DSAR, provide any audio files uh, whilst also redacting things like phone numbers or or, uh, or other, other individuals' names within that audio file as well. Cool. So we'll just move further through. So I just want to kind of summarize, um, and as we've spoken about this being a kind of increasing issue and, and the, the theme of the... Uh, the, the webinar here to be kind of, are, are you really ready? Um, we just wanted to show you just kind of what you maybe would need to understand to have in place uh, for you to be able to get through these DSARs um, in, in, a, in a timely manner uh, to hit that 30 day turnaround timeline. And to, to assist you, we've obviously got the clear review, which we've demonstrated through those screenshots. Um, AI and automation capabilities, something we're very, very focused on driving towards um, and the challenge of the unstructured data, um, you know, the, the engine processing that we have here is market leading. Um, and so you can really get to that information that you need to quickly and accurately. Um, and uh, that is all from me. Um, Nick, I don't know if you wanted to add anything further. Yeah, th th thanks, Ollie. And, and thank you for going through that. Uh, really, really appreciate it. I just wanted to... Uh, touch on something you just mentioned there about your 60,000 um, documents and uh, there's a great rule of thumb uh, that's been applied in the UD discovery industry uh, for some time which is the amount of data that uh, your average user creates in a in a year and uh, we've not done this yet Ollie, so I'm going to ask you a question what do you think the average uh, document count is for a normal user per year how many emails and documents and stuff do they create um, I wouldn't know, Nick, actually, to be honest, but I think it's an exceptional <laughs> amount. <laughs> oh, that's good. So, so the average is around 14,000 to 20,000 documents per year per person. Yeah. So your, your 60,000 uh, is, is like, well, if it's a three-year claim, you know, that I, you know Ollie, you've, you've worked at Newix for two and a half years, you said, two, two and a half years. So you could do the rule of thumb and say, well, probably Ollie's created somewhat, somewhere near... 50,000 documents that contain your name, let alone other people that have spoken about you in your hiring process, in your review process, all these other things. So it suddenly accumulates. So your story of 60,000 actually becomes very realistic when you apply the very simple rule of thumb, which is 14 to 20,000 documents per year per person for an average user. And, and for me, I kind of want to just highlight the sort of, sort of three key, key areas of review. So Ollie's taking you through the reviews specific capability, which is absolutely marvelous. 
The other two things to consider is where are your sources of information? Where are the where is the data repositories that the PII is likely to reside? And don't forget, you may have other third party apps that you are excluding, which should be included. Um, and then the other piece is that processing bit. How do I process data efficiently? If I have AI capability and NLP capability, is there other uses and benefits for it? If I'm looking for PII, could I look for other regulatory data or legal data or use it for other purposes? So finding that truth in whatever ma manner that, that happens. So um, Ollie, thank you ever so much for, for your insights. Really, really appreciated. Um, I was just gonna ask Mark to come back online. Have we received any questions? I've, I'm on full screen here, so I've not seen uh, what questions we have, sir. Okay, well, I'm just going to throw it open to all our attendees. If they have any questions, could they pop them in the relevant box? And I shall give it a few seconds. Someone is typing. Uh, uh, whilst I'm waiting for them to finish typing their question, um, gents, thank you very much. Very informative, as always. Okay, we have the first question in. Can you cater for endpoint collection, i.e. data sitting on laptops, workstations, or other places? Nick? Uh, yes, is the answer. Uh, we have a um, agent uh, called the Enterprise Collection Center agent. Uh, that agent can sit pretty much on any uh, OS um, within reason, Linux, uh, Mac, Windows, of course, pretty much all flavors. Um, that allows um, Nuix to run a, a review and uh, an index and search capability on the endpoint, pulling back relevant information back to the Koala control in order for it then to run through the review process that, that uh, Ollie's taken. Um, one thing to consider with endpoints is there's actually two types of behavior you want to look at an endpoint. First behavior is data at rest. So this is the data that we've created and it's just sitting on the hard drive. Um, then that might be of interest and you might pull it for a DSAR. The other one is, of course, is data in motion. What is the actual user's behavior on the endpoint at any given point? That uses another Nuix agent and that will be covered in another webinar. But yes, to answer that question, Mark, thank you very much. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. There's a couple more coming in. Um, I'll throw this one to Ollie, I think. Um, can the DPO see a different view to the reviewers? Uh, yes, so yeah, so um, Discover is uh, pretty flexible in terms of what you can actually allow people to see. Um, so if you wanted your reviewers to only be able to go through and kind of look at those documents and make decisions and apply redactions, but you didn't want them to be able to delete those documents or, you know, download those documents, um, then you could set up permissions in, in such a way that would prevent them from doing that. Um, and then obviously if you have, you know, a DPO kind of monitoring that review process, you could have them looking at a review dashboard, managing data going in and out of those cases um, and, and manage those permissions that way as well. So yeah, a com completely kind of um, uh, separate, complete separation of group permissions uh, is possible. Excellent. Okay. I have a couple more actually coming in. Um, I don't think you should name people, but um, yeah, first one. Um, first name is begin with M. You mentioned using RedX for PII identification. Any recommended indexing best practice for said use case? Well, I'll read that out again. You mentioned using RedX for PII identification. Any recommended indexing best practice for said use case? Um, I don't have any um, particularly. We use uh, DT index for for our index building uh, on on Discover. Um, in terms of index best practices, there are uh, there's some documentation associated with Discover to uh, to ensure that you're kind of running those regexes efficiently. Um, that documentation will be specific to how Discover reads it as a regex. Uh, so, for example, specifically to to discover, you'll have to have um, a couple of uh, hashtags at the start of a regex to dictate that you're searching a, uh, a regex itself. Um, so there, there is documentation out there at the moment. Um, it's not something I'll, I'll kind of go into on this webinar, but uh, but yeah, um, I don't know, Nick, if you had any further information on that from uh, a different perspective other than discover. Uh, 
Yeah, so um, so the in the broader context, um, mentioned the uh, Nuix Neo solution. Um, Nuix Neo uses um, the NLP solution as part of the engine, and what the NLP uh, solution brings is uh, cognitive expression. So what happens is that that's um, using regular expressions, but with NLP and context wrapped around it. So, for example, you may use a, a common reg, regex um, with the likes of like, identifying a, a credit card number. So credit card numbers are quite, quite well defined in the way of the regex. You would then validate it using a learn algorithm, but perhaps you want to be really specific. So you would then ask the NLP engine, is there words that describe the credit card string as being expected? So, for example, um, I could be sending an email to Mark and, and it says, hey, Mark, here's my credit card and then the string. So the engine recognizes the string using regex, but now it's recognizing that there's actually um, NLP words that basically say, here's a credit card. So it validates and it's what they call cognitive expressioning. So there are multiple methods in which we would use uh, the regex uh, sort of methodology, but to really get rid of all those um, false positives. You want it just be positive positive, so we use NLP to enhance it. Perfect. I'm going to cut the short term now because a couple more questions bouncing in. Um, and first name again with C. How is the handling of Teams messages? We are seeing the majority of Teams messages as relevant to organizational investigations. How do we render in the back end compared to the review platform? So I think I'll summarize that. How well do we cope with Teams? Um, Oliver, is that something you want to comment on? Yeah, yeah, sure. So there, there are um, there, there's a few ways you can process Teams data, and obviously you want that to be in a reviewable format. Chat data notoriously difficult to handle in terms of processing and and displaying that uh, in a document viewer. Um, we do have the capability of running that through our engine and then displaying that in a in a neat kind of chat bubble format that's actually interactive. Um, so you'd be able to see a nice little header of the conversation and and click on uh, individuals that are a part of that conversation to then highlight where those messages are in the conversation. Um, further to that, you can see join and leave events as well. So you can see when people joined and when people left, uh, along with any kind of um, uh, emojis that are associated with that conversation and the messages as well. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, first name submitted by Jay, uh, with the AI built into Nuix, can the redaction happen without human intervention, also based on NLP as well? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I think it, it, probably yes in the future. Um, right now, the AI functionality that we've got is aimed at the engine. And I think there would always be caution that do you want it to be fully automated? I think there's always going to be the dip test to go, are we redacting the right things? Um, so uh, I've not seen those workflows yet where AI specifically is going, I've identified all this PII, I'm immediately going to redact it. Um, I've not seen that go through, and I'm sure using the RAMP automation technology, we probably could do that. Um, I, would, I would question as to, we need to check that you need to dip test it to make sure it is correctly identifying the right stuff. Hello, Ollie, if you've got a slightly different response to that. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it is, um, it's a challenging one. Um, I think it's slightly easier for um, PII that is kind of numbers based um, and, and more kind of specific alphanumeric. Um, if you're working with names, so as we saw with some of the examples before, um, to be able to have a system that would um, intelligently know whether the word hope is somebody's name or just somebody saying that they are hoping for something. Um, they're two very different things and it, it creates a bit of a challenge there. Grant being another name, you know, um, you could be talking about a grant as in, uh, you know, a, a document grant or you can be talking about an individual grant. Um, so the, there are specific challenges there um, that you do face, but then further down the line with, with NLP, taking the context either side of that particular word, um, you would maybe then be able to drill down further as to actually whether it is talking about a person called Grant or um, or a Grant itself. 
Um, so it's, it's definitely something that's being looked into. And then obviously, once you've got that data in with the redactions in place, uh, it would just be a kind of QC process from that point forward um, for you to be able to make sure that everything is redacted that you want uh, that you want to be. So. Okay, thanks, James. Yeah, I, I think um, the risk with the capital law would jump out at me at this one. And but as with all things in, in digital and the way technology is going, never say never. Um, I personally don't think we're just there yet, but close to it. I want to say we're there. I don't think anybody's really there yet. Um, I'm going to make this one the last question, I think. Um, I'm conscious that it's almost lunchtime. Uh, short question, um, why do we need new X if we already have Microsoft Purview? Do you enhance it in any way? Brutal last question. Um, uh, so yes, um, uh, we uh, fully enhance Purview. Um, uh, we have multiple methods of connecting to Office 365 in the first place. We would connect to the Office 365 environment using the Nuix engine, but we also have uh, techniques using Rampiva to connect to smartly the Purview solution. Um, where we, we differ from Purview is Nuix can take documents all the way into uh, legal and essentially into court um, by the entire workflow that, that prepares documentations to be exported re ready for whatever last part parser you is. Um, Purview doesn't do that. Um, Purview will always require you to, start to export that data out to a third party for some sort of review. Um, that's where we kick in. So obviously if we have a method of connecting to Purview, we will take the data directly out of what is in the compliance center from Microsoft, bring it into Nuix, we do all our magic, we run all our NLP, um, all these uh, various different processes that he's shown, ready for that onward um, export of data back to the requester. So yes, a full enhancement to Purview, we're not the replacement to it. Okay, perfect. Ollie, I'll give you 20 seconds if you want to comment, not in any way, and if not, I think we will wrap up. No, I think, uh, I think I'm good, yeah, if we've only got the 20 seconds left, then uh, I think Nick's covered it there. So, um, so I'll leave it at that, Mark, but uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, you've noticed on the bottom of the screen there, um, I'll just read it out in case you're not actually looking at the screen. Can you please take a time to complete the survey for us? Um, we, as, as with all these webinars, we need to understand are these worth doing or not mentioned doing. So um, there's a couple of questions. We are running out of time. Yes, I did, I've done all those. I'm going to say thank you, gentlemen, uh, Ollie, Nick, and to the people behind the scenes who organize this. And, of course, to the people who have dialed in to listen to us, rabble on for the last hour. Um, thank you very much. Um, any questions, reach out to us at newx.com and anybody will be able to take your, take your query and get back to you as soon as we possibly can. So wish you all a good day. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.